Welcome to the Dreams Are Real podcast, where we aim to ignite the fire that allows you to unleash your greatest potential. I'm your host, Dan McPherson, and I'm on a mission to help you own your story on the way to building your ideal life. The first step toward achieving your dreams is to overcome the momentum of zero. Take a step and let that motion dispel the emotions of fear, worry, or self-doubt. No matter where you are in your life or career, only you can make that choice. The good news, you've got this. Why? Because dreams are real. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Dreams Are Real podcast. I'm your host, Dan McPherson. Today, our guest is Tom James. Who is Tom James? He is a true digital nomad. He is a digital advertising expert. He is a wanderer of the world. He is a friend and he is a force of positive energy and chill vibes in the world. (laughs) And you will be as excited to hear his story as I know that I am as well. Good to have you with me, Tom. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. All of those descriptors that I shared, and, and we met when we were in the Philippines, I, I remember my first impressions of seeing the, the wavy hair and the smile and the, <laughs> the, the, the total relaxation. When people do ask you, what do you do? Which was, I think, one of the first questions I asked you. What, what do you how do you respond? What do you say? Well, I think when people ask that question, normally they, they're asking, like, what is your job? But I don't always like to that to be the answer but i do lead with that so i will always say i run a marketing agency and i travel around the world that's that's basically what i would say to people yeah and that's that's basically what you would say how how would you say it i guess a little bit more like how would you expand on that as you got further into conversation what do you really think of when you think of what you do i feel like i Well, yeah, I have to, I have two avenues to go down. So there's the work avenue, what I do and what I feel like I'm doing at the moment, especially, especially this year and last year is like opening up a lot of clients eyes to like money they're leaving on the table with their marketing practices because yeah, when, when a new client gets referred to me and I start working with them, they, uh, they will often be like, oh, we want to do paid advertising or we're already doing paid advertising and we want your help. And I always assume that they're already kind of got it half figured. And then I'll look at their accounts and like half the time or most of the time, actually, that they're like getting so much wrong. And that's the best feeling for me because I know it's like so easy for me to like, I can just like do a quick audit and help them already or they can become my client and I can fix everything for them. So Yeah. At the moment, I feel like I'm like really helping clients realize what they're missing out on with their digital advertising. So getting even more in depth into that is kind of pretty impossible because I work in so many different niches. So for example, one niche I really love to work in is real estate, helping realtors sell houses, developments, commercial property, whatever. And, uh, I just know what works in most countries. So whenever I get a new client there, I will usually have a look at what they're doing already. Probably some of it's good, probably some of it's bad, and I know exactly what to do. So that's kind of the stage I'm at at the moment. Just, you know, I find it quite easy, which is so nice to know exactly how to help these uh, new clients I get on board, like improve their digital advertising. And then the other side, um, I'm like aimlessly traveling, uh, not aimlessly, but like, uh, I just enjoy new places. I get stressed if I like stay in the same place for too long or eat in the same restaurant too much or whatever, even if I like the food, which can become stressful itself sometimes. But yeah, I guess I just like, I, I, I feel stressed that I need to, there's so many things in the world to see and I want to see a lot of them before I die. So that's like my other focus, I guess. Most people gain comfort by being in the same place for a long period of time. You like to move around. When do you start feeling that stress? How long do you have to be in a place for you before you think, I've got to get out of here? That's a good question. I stayed in Bali for 
uh, about four months this year, which is the longest I've stayed somewhere for a while. But we were in like a few different places. We moved to a few different rooms, a few different villas. And every day we were trying to do, or every other day we tried to do something new. But then, yeah, after like four months, I did get a little bit like, uh, okay, next, please. Um, so yeah, maybe a, a couple months is a good guide, but it depends <laughs> on the place. It depends on the place. Like uh, at the moment we're moving hotel, maybe we're not staying for more than a week in a place. Yeah, the longest we stayed recently was like 10 days, I think. And I don't know. That's pretty comfortable for me at the moment. So, yeah. Where are some of the most fun places or interesting places that you've been? I would say there's an area. uh, So Luzon Island is like the, I think it's the biggest island, but it's the island that Manila is on in the Philippines. And if you keep following it down to the southern area called Bicol, I was there earlier this, earlier this year. And they just had like the most amazing, beautiful islands, white sand beaches, amazing trees, clear sea, and like nobody there. And it it was like kind of low season, but kind of not at the same time. It just wasn't very touristy area at all. And I really felt like I was in like a paradise that hasn't really been discovered or commercialized yet, which I think is super hard to find. So that was like, I don't know, that was amazing for me. Yeah, we found this amazing island. We were like the only people on it, bar some people that lived in like a tree house. And actually, I, I, I wanted to live there for a while, but they didn't have a good enough power to charge a laptop. They only had a little battery that would be able to charge a phone. So uh, yeah, I realized I couldn't live there. But uh, anyway. Pretty hard yeah, to but, run a digital marketing uh, company from with no power. Well, yeah, that was, that was the only issue. They had amazing uh, LTE signal. So the internet would have been no issue. It was just the powering of a laptop. Yeah, that is an issue. <laughs> Time to get a solar charger and go back. <laughs> exactly. Well, I, sa- I said to my girlfriend, could we not say, hey, we'll buy you a solar, solar power pack, whatever, if you let us build a small house on this plot of land. Problem is, I think the government own all those type of stuff and they would never let you do that. But anyway... <laughs> Something it's an incredible crazy. journey. When you travel like that and you, you move every couple of months, are you, are you aiming for places that are beautiful or are you looking for particular types of activities? Are you just looking for something that's new? What, what pushes that movement? Good point. So I, like, I love to plan stuff in, uh, on Google Maps. So on Google Maps, they have like a, um, you can put a green pin on places called, and it's called want to go. It means you want to go there. And then you also have another way to save places, which is favorites. So what I do is if I find a place, I see a place randomly online or something, or when I'm researching, I'll put a green pin on it because I want to go there. And then when I've been there, I change it to a red pin. So this favorites love heart pin. And I guess that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to plan as many green pins as I can all around the world and change as many of these green pins into red pins because that means I've been there. So, um, but the first thing I do is I check, I check where it's going to be, where the weather is going to be good. So <laughs> need uh, good weather. Got it. I'm, I, I'm, I'm usually trying to follow the sun. Obviously if I go to more snowy destinations, I'll be following when it's good to be snowy, for example. But at the moment traveling around Asia, like, yeah, I'm trying to follow the sun and avoid the monsoons. So yeah, I'll just like, um, For example, we're not sure where else we'll go in Southern Thailand. So I'm going to be doing a bit more research on other places to visit in Southern Thailand, like national parks, waterfalls, beaches. And if there's an area where there's like a few of them, not just those things, but other fun activities as well, or nice hotels or whatever, then I'll be like, okay, well, maybe we should spend a few days there. And then I'll look at, oh, we could go here. And then we could go here for a few days. And then we could go to this island for a few days. I'm just trying to like plan a route kind of like that. But a bit off the cuff. I don't even know what hotel we're staying in tomorrow at the moment. But uh, that, yeah. that's, living, that's living spontaneously for sure. When you describe that lifestyle, to many, I'm sure it probably sounds extravagant or maybe even impossible to accomplish. How have you accomplished it and still balance out the things that you need to do, like working and running an agency, all of the things that, that keep you being able to move forward? Yeah, so I actually, um, I don't think I see my lifestyle that different to 
what I imagine a lot of people, a lot of my peers, for example, back in the UK are living. I tend to not imagine it like that. Uh, and, uh, I'll explain why in a second, um, but I'm still doing the same things. I, I'm sleeping in a bed at night. I'm eating some food throughout the day and I'm doing my work throughout the day and throwing in some more fun stuff. Right. And that's pretty much what a lot of people, what of my friends are doing. The only difference is I'm not spending all my time in exactly the same place, exactly the same house, eating all the same stuff, whatever, having exactly the same daily routine. But I really don't see it's that different to that. Um, honestly, but at the hotel I'm at right now, um, it's quite a nice hotel and lots of people here, they're clearly on their like one week or two week break from their, um, from their normal lives. And like, yeah, they, most of them are like uh, European and American. Uh, yeah. It's a little bit pricier this place and most of them are very old and it like really hit me like, Oh my God, this is like their, their big break. This is like what they've looked forward to, whatever. But for me, I just like popped over to an Island that was next to me. Right. Um, and I'm like, anyway, uh, so, so back to one of the points I, I like to preach is like, um, if you are constantly traveling around, instead of paying your rent in the place that you live or your mortgage or whatever, you're just changing that into paying hotels. So if we're talking from a financial point of view, um, I don't see it having to be that much different. Having said that, it can be very um, uh, different in different countries. So right now I'm traveling around Asia, especially could, like one big reason is my girlfriend, she, it's, it's kind of tricky for her to get visas to a lot of other places. So we've been stuck in this area for a bit, but it's fine because I love Asia, but it's a lot cheaper than if I was maybe being like super nomadic around like America or Europe or something. So that's not something I've experienced yet. So anyway, I still think that I'm living a pretty like similar life to other people. As I, I genuinely think that I get my work done in the daytime each day. And I, yeah, just cause I'm staying in different places each night, it, it, it shouldn't be too much of a difference. Um, yeah. Does that answer the question? No, I, I think that's, I think that's a very powerful and significant point. You are trading, as you said, rent and maybe the things that many others would invest their money into that give them security and comfort in their own way and fulfill them in that way for what fulfills you of being able to travel and be nomadic and have all of these different experiences. And yet you're living the life that everyone else does. You're just doing it in different locations. You've crafted that as a lifestyle. Yeah. I think that's a phenomenal perspective and one that many would benefit from. It's one that I did not see or understand before traveling to Asia earlier this year. And now mm. I am compelled by. <laughs> Were you always drawn to, to travel and movement even as a kid? Actually, I, I struggle to answer this question because my, my mind has, my perspective on the world has changed so much since I was younger. Now I'm like, yeah, now I'm just like wanting to go everywhere and do everything. <laughs> Um, I think I'm really not sure. I think when I was younger, I, I thought, why would I ever want to travel outside of the UK? Because the UK is awesome. And like my parents never put that in my mind. They never told me like the UK is amazing everywhere else is not. They never told me that. But like, I think I kind of thought that somehow. Um, but then yeah, the internet comes along and you yeah i was able to like kind of like discover about other things and then kind of like get more excited about going to other places i did travel a lot around the uk and then eventually europe with horse riding when i was younger but that really wasn't travel because we were doing the same thing every weekend we would just go to a place where we'd ride horses ride the horses and then go back home again whether it was in france italy or wherever that was not, that's not travel. Yeah. Technically you're going across the border, but it, it's, it's really not, you're not doing anything local, what, uh, local in that area whatsoever. So that's kind of weird. The fact that I did travel quite a bit, but really not at all. Um, so then, 
so, so one thing I really got into when I kind of got access to the internet, when I was like in my early teens, um, I started listening to podcasts actually one by, um, the 500 startups. It's like a, um, a, a VC, they incubate startups in, uh, San Francisco. And that actually got me like interested in the world of business, but also opened my eyes to the world. And then, yeah, going slightly off on a tangent here, but, but just before I went to university, I, I just had a random thought, why don't I get, try and get an internship somewhere? And I uh, couldn't in the UK because it's like, well, you, I probably could, but it's not very normal for you to do a quick internship before you go off to university at the age of 18 but it's much easier to do one in China. <laughs> and I honestly don't remember why I wanted to go to China because at that stage I wasn't passionate about wanting to discover the world. I think it was just the, the fact that I could go somewhere else and work and that would be great for a month. Anyway, that was like the defining moment in my life because then I went to China uh, to do an internship in Beijing and I, and I was like stuck in this, crazy different culture and i was like oh my god this is the best thing ever and then yeah that was like really the the changing point my like views on traveling or whatever was it that your eyes were open that so many cultures were different and that that in being different that it was fascinating or was it something else i think so it was exciting i've always been like really curious about learning new things i guess but I guess that's pretty normal for people to be curious about learning new things. I just find loads of things. I find new stuff exciting, new people, new places, new views, innovative stuff. Like, yeah, it's just, um, I don't know what it is. Probably it pumps some chemicals around my body more than other people. I don't know, but, uh, yeah, it excites me. So, yeah. One of our recent guests, Damien suggested that we should be brave enough to be radically curious. And it seems like you've been, you have been brave enough to be radically curious and take the steps that go with that. That's a good way of putting it. <laughs> as, as you think back to that childhood, I have to ask, you said horses. Were you competitively riding horses? Yeah, I was riding for um, a county in the, so in the sport I do called mountain games, or the sport I did, uh, it's like, um, it's really hard to explain this. It's like a athletic stunt riding, but it's racing. So you're in teams and it's all about which team is first to finish each race and you get points and then whoever gets the most points wins. That's the basic premise. Really exciting to watch. And um, yeah, so I was doing that competitively, competing every single weekend from like early April till October. And then throughout the winter, you just train. So I rode for like a county. We became British champions in like 2011, I think. And then also rode for England on the national team a few times in like France. Uh, I represented England individually in the European championships in Italy, also in Northern Ireland. So I was European champion twice. And I was second in the world as an individual rider in 2012, I think. Yeah, you didn't do just a little bit of riding. You were all about it. Do you still Completely. ride? My whole life. No. Your whole life. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I was just riding all the time. I never played. I never really, yeah, I watched TV, I guess. I never played video games. Never really went out with my school friends. I was like, always had good friends, but they were always just friends in school, never outside of school. Cause I was always riding horses and then the weekends I'd always be away competing somewhere. Uh, what was your question again? Well, I, I'll ask a follow up to that okay. first. What did you learn or take away from, from the years having spent competing? <laughs> so many things. You seem so much more laid back than most high level champ champion or highly ranked people in a sport. I'm curious yeah. what you took away. Is it, is that a confidence that came from it or did you, did you take other things? I always got so nervous. It's funny you say confidence. I always got so nervous before, um, each competition, uh, on the mornings of each day I was competing. I couldn't eat anything. Like, I know that's bad advice. You should always eat. I couldn't eat a single thing. Otherwise I'm going to be sick. Sometimes I could eat a banana, 
I would always feel super nervous all the time, um, all the time. And it still happens today. Like when I tried my first scuba diving, I got so nervous. I was asking so many questions and then I went in and I nailed it and I was great with the scuba diving. Same with the horse riding. I would get so nervous, so nervous. A lot of people in my sport, not a lot of people, but I noticed the people that didn't get so nervous, they were like, I, I don't know what it was. Maybe they weren't thinking about it enough. Maybe they weren't becoming prepared enough. Uh, but that nervousness made me like, I guess, get more prepared so that I would, yeah, be a, like a better rider than the majority of people. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. Um, but yeah, so I would, but when I was in the teams, I was always like, um, that you don't really have an official captain in the teams, but sometimes the trainers, especially when you have a national team, they kind of elect someone as like the leader because it's like you, you're like supposed to be the rock in the team. The one that like keeps everyone calm, especially some of the guy riders would get like, if you mess start messing up one race, they, w they may start messing up loads. And I wasn't like that. I was a bit more level headed. If I make a mistake in one race, I'm going to like, uh, not mess up the next. I'm going to like get myself together. And so on some of the national teams, I was like, uh, and my County team, actually, I was kind of like the guy in charge to keep everyone like, um, in check and calm and stuff like that. And, um, yeah. So I think I, I learned, I'm not sure if it's leadership, but I definitely got some skills from being like, um, yeah, being able to prepare people, calm people down, get people in the right frame of mind. I'm pretty team. sure that's leadership. I'm pretty, pretty yeah, confident it falls into that. <laughs> that's, and I, I was starting to ask earlier, do you still ride today? Ah, yes, that was it. So no, because yeah, at the moment I'm traveling around Asia, kind of impossible to ride horses here. I mean, there probably are some horses you can ride. Also, my sport isn't, uh, there aren't any Asian countries that do it. I don't think, I think Iran does it. And there's a few others in central Asia, but, um, yeah, no, it's, it's very much a sport that you have to live at home, train all the time, see your horses every day to be really good. But my brother, he still lives at home, rides all the time and competes and he's like competing at top level for England. So when you yeah. visit, do you still enjoy riding? I miss it a lot when I'm away and I kind of enjoy getting back to it, but um, I had some really bad problems with my knees and I flew back from Philippines to the UK a couple of years ago to ride with my brother at a world championship, which is a bit weird. But when I got home, I hadn't really lost it too much, which was great. Like I, I'd still got it if you like. Um, and then, yeah, I start competing and my knees buckle. I completely mm. ruined the championship. We we did like we I didn't even finish the weekend because my I went to an ambulance. So um, yeah, that ruined it. Yeah, that's uh, so that, that'll that, ruin actually. a lot of things. Ambulances yeah. are not fun. Uh, yeah, no. After riding, after catching the bug to be a true digital nomad and be be restless and moving, how did you get started as an entrepreneur? I mean, I think that started much earlier. So when I kind of got access, I mean, one, I think when I was like 13, maybe or something like that, my mom and dad bought me and my brother a laptop to share and our internet was like really bad actually. But I started making like videos of horse riding, just like clips put together, put them online uh, and put them to music as well. So made them a bit more fun still. So you can see the com competition, but also, so you're showing the highlights uh, like a like a football highlights video i guess maybe and um they that got like good traction in my sport um at one stage i was definitely like the most viewed youtube channel in the sport and yeah that that kind of got me into like the whole digital and social media i was like what is this like wow people watch my videos and you can talk to them and you know they got interested in it that way um and then I became naturally interested in like business and entrepreneurships and uh, entrepreneurship and startups through listening to podcasts, as I said before. So they kind of blended together, like the digital side, getting into this digital side online, plus being interested in like business and stuff merged together. And I naturally just like started random projects and marketing stuff. And then, yeah, people 
started paying me money to make them websites and market their websites uh, when I was in like my, like, I guess like 15, 14, 15, 16, 17, that kind of thing. I started a few businesses myself, uh, just small things. Um, I love how you casually so, throw yeah. off. I was 14, 15, 16, and I just started a few businesses. It's what I did. That's, that, that's think, not, yeah, you, you, you get that that's not common, right? <laughs> you, you can't, you can do that stuff so easily when you're a, um, wet, when, when it's the internet, right? You know, right. Uh, I, I bought a camera. I learned a bit of photography. I, uh, set up a, a business, if you like, called Ultimate Media UK. It's cringy. I say that now. And I started taking photos of the, some of the horse riding competitions I went to and then selling those photos to people and printing them and shipping them to wherever they lived. Um, I mean, it's not, is it really a business? I mean, kind of, but also, yeah, it's very easy to, to, to do that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Did, did those businesses bridge into DJ or being a DJ or was that a separate endeavor? Uh, being a DJ, like I went to university, <clears throat> I always loved music. My mom had an amazing taste in music. She still has an amazing taste in music, like dance music. She got me into like a lot of dance trance stuff. And then, yeah, n like, uh, I really got into electronic music. I, l I still love it. At the moment, my favorite music is house music. And um, anyway, I went to university, started going to see some big DJs because they got some, like, some of the world's biggest DJs went to perform in Manchester. I went with some of my friends and like these, me and these two guys, we would like party uh, watching these DJs. And we, were, we, we saw some of the lesser known DJs that were still reasonably famous. We were like, oh, these guys, like, we can do better than them. Like, these are professional DJs, and we can definitely do better than them. So <clears throat> we bought, like, a DJ set together. We, like, all chipped in money, learned how to play together, like, watching uh, tutorials on YouTube. Um, but that's only half of it, right? The actual learning how to physically DJ and, like, I guess, becoming good at it musically. Uh, musically being a DJ, is that the right way to say things? Uh, knowing how to, like you know, put the music together to, 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 to make a crowd happy. Right. But then the other side of it is marketing yourself. So I think that's where, um, like the entrepreneurial side of my, uh, my personality came in and uh, yeah, I was, I had no interest in making music actually, which is how most DJs get famous and tour the world. Uh, but I knew how to brand myself. So I branded myself like reasonably well, started contacting people offering value and yeah, got myself into like DJ in, I think 17 countries or 18 countries on yeah four continents, which is pretty cool. So yeah, not anything like, not like the biggest of festivals or anything, but like, um, yeah, that was an amazing run. So that was definitely a mixture of passion for music and like marketing skills. Like without the marketing skills, I'd have been like still in my bedroom, just DJing for fun. So yeah. And is that still a passion or have you moved a different direction? Actually, I was just, uh, we were just eating a buffet at the hotel and there's this, uh, they have a DJ on tonight and I was, he was playing some good music and I was like, damn, I missed that. Like same as when I think back to horse riding, I was some, I also missed that a lot. It's impossible to kind of be a DJ. If, I, if I'm traveling around as I'm traveling right now, it's kind of impossible to DJ because like, what, they're just going to say, okay, we want you to fly to Vietnam. I mean, I could do that. It's just not my focus. Um, right. My focus is very much on my marketing agency. That's still my passion. The DJing was actually always a, more as a hobby. I knew I could never make it big because to be big, you have to make your own music, right? Um, only DJs from a long time ago came became famous from just DJing, but now anyone can DJ, right? It's, it's, it's reasonably easy. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, my focus is like very much on marketing agency and traveling, but I'm always tempted to buy a DJ set and just like, you know, DJ in the bedroom here now. <laughs> um, as, yeah, so yeah. as you've moved away from that and, and to focusing more upon the marketing agency, how has that transition worked for you? Is running an agency, running a running your own company different than you thought it would have been? It depends when I, when you were talking, when, 
when I compare it to because uh, back when I started learning about startups and stuff, I was like, okay, so you think of a cool idea, you find a cool team, somehow prove the idea, you get investment, you grow the idea, you make loads of money. And that, you know, that's, it, it was never like, I was never thinking, okay, this is how you get rich, but <laughs> that's generally how you hear all these startup stories, right? And anyway, that, that, it turns out like most startups and businesses, that's not how it works. That's just how a few in Silicon Valley work, which I very much still very interested in that, uh, that kind of way of doing business, but this is completely different. Um, so I never, yeah, it is a business, but I never really think of it as a business because it happened so naturally. Cause when I was like, 14, 15, 16, I was doing all these odd jobs, websites, like random marketing stuff, social media stuff throughout university. I got more and more like slightly bigger clients on and off. They got better and better at stuff. And then I really got into advertising. And by the time I left university, I was like, well, I can just, you know, keep doing this. And then that's money, right? That's, that's my career. So it happened naturally. I was never consciously like, okay, I'm going to start a business. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. It's more that a business developed rather than you started one. Totally. And it's more that like, also it's interesting. It, I was like freelancing, right? I was a freelancer and I still kind of am a freelancer that uses a team. Seriously. Like I haven't even branded my agency as anything but my own name at the moment because that's how I get all my referrals. Um, so yeah, I'm a, like a, a glorified freelancer with a team. I wouldn't say I'm building a business yet. I don't know. But um, yeah, that's how I see it at the moment. So yeah. Along this journey, whether it be as a digital nomad or an entrepreneur or a competitor, what is the biggest lesson or two that you've learned along the way? Ah, here's a really good one. So I'm trying to think how other, I've heard other people talk about this type of stuff. I think people say like the phrase, you make your own luck. I think that's one. I, I remember saying yes to so many opportunities, like with the DJing, for example, I would like, yeah, create mixes for random guest podcasts. I would DJ random people's birthday parties. I would chat with a DJ online at like 3 a.m. whilst this DJ is in like Japan. Like when you get into so many networking opportunities or like and the word the keyword i guess is opportunities when you like uh expose yourself to so many opportunities things happen right and that's just so true also with marketing also so like um a lot of djs that so so i actually created a group to help djs um like maybe two years ago i lost motivation completely to continue pushing that group um, the main reasons were like, I was giving people actionable help and they were saying, this doesn't work. And I was like, prove to me that you've done it. And then, and then I'll agree that it doesn't work. And none of them were doing it. And that's the main thing. I was like putting in so much work, creating so many different opportunities. And that's when you get the luck. I must've spoken to so many different clubs until that one club says, yeah, come to Germany and play for us. Right. But it happens. So like, that's one thing I learned, like, um, exposing yourself to loads of opportunities will eventually lead to something, something happening, something happening. Good. Right. Am I explaining that? Well, I, I think so. I, I think opportunity is all around us. Whether we are willing to do the work to grab it and do something with it makes a huge difference. Yeah. Along those lines, separate from that, is there something that you wish you'd known years ago that you know now is there something that jumps out at you say, man, I really wish I'd known that it would have made a huge difference for me or has it grown so organically that for you, there's really not. So honestly, this, I, I can't answer this question. Uh, the, the main reason is I don't have like a particular regret at the moment or like, damn, I wish I'd done something or I wish this hadn't turned out this way. I'm reasonably like very happy with exactly where I am. So I can't think of any way 
that changing something would like be of advantage to me. If that does that make sense? I think it makes um, sense, and I think you did answer the question. Answering the okay. question is be at peace with who you are, right? Is that you've from the moment that I've met you, you've been, I would say, in in many ways, comfortable in your own skin, comfortable with where you're at, and that you're that you're on a path that of your choosing. And yeah. that maybe, maybe that's not a lesson that you had to learn, but it's one that's become evident over time and that would apply to so many in our audience. Certainly it would apply to me as it's taken me many years to become comfortable in my own skin. Well, actually, yeah. Like I, so people uh, that I'm like, I say fr- friends like this, you know, on uh, for example, Facebook, I have loads of friends who are marketers some of them great friends with some of them like semi friends with. And then like, I get them coming into my DMS like, Oh, Hey, I can help you scale your agency and like 10 X your clients and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, dude, not everybody wants to grow that fast. And like, you know what I mean? There's so much of this, like everyone's in a rush to build, um, the bit, your business as big as possible. And maybe I'm, I'm going to regret not doing that now, but, um, but yeah, I'm I'm happy with the rate things are going at the moment. So it's like that, that's uh, yeah, that's, that's I, I'm good. At peace with who I am, I guess, or <laughs> whatever you said before. <laughs> are there any particularly useful resources, whether it be books or people or programs or anything else that have made it e- tools, maybe that have made it easier to chase your dreams and do the things that you do? Google. <laughs> like, I don't, I'm not even joking. Like, uh, actually you were at the, the talks I did earlier this year around Asia. And like, um, I had a, I had my, I had my slides come up saying like at this stage of my life, I Googled how to do this. And I found this when I was telling like kind of a bit of my life story. And it's so true. I like literally use Google so much, to, or at least especially in the past, I use Google so much to figure stuff out. If I had a question or I wasn't sure about something, you can Google it. And even if you don't find the exact answer, you're going to find something that's maybe going to help you get on the right path. And I don't specifically mean Google. I just mean searching for the answer. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a, probably a horrible answer, but it's like so true. So many people don't do that, which infuriates me. But I guess that's just more opportunities for me, right? If other people <laughs> aren't doing that. Uh, but other good resources. Um, like with marketing and DJing, um, I, I hate to be platform sp- uh, specific, but I have to be. Like Facebook has been a godsend. There's been there's like groups full um, full of DJs sharing tips on all sorts of stuff, like the best tutorials to learn how to DJ, how to get booked in clubs, how to brand yourself, blah 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 blah. Um, so yeah, that was really helpful when I was DJing. But like for marketing, there's so many marketing groups full of advice from people. Half those people are still trying to sell you stuff, but you just ignore them when they try to start trying to sell you stuff. Um, if you don't think it's worth it, but then also the connections you make through the groups as well. And those communities that like, um, yeah. So I guess my answer there is like the marketing communities, but it all happens on Facebook, on Facebook groups. So yeah. Best resources, curiosity and community. Got it. Mm. You're very good at summarizing my answers. <laughs> <laughs> What does the the phrase or the idea that dreams are real mean to you? So to me, it is like um, the word dream has this, um, a, it has the, people think of a dream as like, this is where I want to be in the future. But then like, if ever you got there, you're just going to have another dream for the future. Whereas what I'm trying to do what I think I'm trying to do anyway, what I think I'm doing is I'm living my dream in the present. Right. Um, maybe I should be doing more future goal setting and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, if you're always like in search or like trying to get somewhere, I feel like maybe you can't really enjoy where you are at the moment. So I'm trying to live in my dream in the present. I don't want to sound too cringy here, but seriously, I'm like trying to live in my dream, uh, life, I guess, in the present, as opposed to always just dreaming about what it's going to look like in the future and hoping I get there one day. 
I think there's a, a a good distinction to be made here. So many people will answer the question, how are you doing with saying, oh, I'm living the dream, and they mean it negatively and sarcastically. You can honestly answer the question, say, I'm living my dream. And that is that that is a a really powerful image to me and connecting with a a joy in the journey to i guess we'll we'll use another cringy phrase maybe but to <laughs> but connecting connecting the joy in the journey rather than having this this stoplight mindset or this this destination mindset but connecting with the path is very powerful when people talk about you and say that you are an example that dreams are real that that you're you're living the dream that they would have for themselves. How does that make you feel? I don't like it. <laughs> Why not? Uh, I get people hit me up on Instagram, sometimes on other platforms, say like, um, I, don't, I, I even hate admitting this right now. Say like, hey, like, how do I be like you? Or how do I do this like you? And uh, yeah, I just... I just hate it. I don't know why I hate it. I just don't like people. I don't like that feeling. I don't know. I hate that feeling of someone saying like, oh, I even hate saying it now. <laughs> someone, will say, someone will say like, I hate where I am now. I want to be in your position. I hate admitting this on camera, but it happens in my, in my inbox and I hate it. Um, maybe you can, you can answer this question for me why I hate it so much, but like, yeah, I think some people like that, but I don't like being told that my life is great and that someone would like to do that or like I'm, I'm living the dream and they want to do it also. Um, yeah, I find it awkward. Uh, I feel like people should be living what like their own thing, if you know what I mean. Uh, if people ask for actionable tips and stuff, that's awesome. But like, uh, yeah, I don't like it when it's like, like that. I think it goes back a little bit. I'm guessing it goes back a little bit to what you said a moment ago or the, the comparison we made a moment ago where you're living your dream and you don't want someone else to live your dream. You want them to live theirs. You want yeah. them to, you want them to do their thing and to be them rather than trying to be you. And maybe part of that's even born from the fact that it, at least from everything you've described in our conversation today you've never lived trying to be someone else. You've just always lived trying to be you. Is that fair? Yeah. I think you uh, explained it much more, much better than me. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, I yeah. get the, I get the feeling of awkwardness for, yeah. f it just sounds like it's maybe a little bit offset as, as we begin to wind down, we have our fortunate five, the five questions that I ask everyone that are areas where maybe you've been fortunate or, or will be or, or are now, and also even a little wider one on the world. First up, what is the most exciting or adventurous thing that you've ever done? And I've, I've seen some pictures of you doing some pretty adventurous things, so I'm very curious of your answer here. <laughs> I mean, whenever I hear the word adventurous, I always think of it like doing like I don't know, stuff like quad biking, zip lining. I did this thing in, um, I think it was in Bohol in, on an island in the Philippines called Bohol. Um, they like suspend you in the air and then they release a clip and you just drop on this massive swing. Um, I actually uploaded a video of me and I was like screaming like a girl. So that's pretty adventurous to me. Uh, also like, uh, I, I, I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. That's pretty big adventure. But seriously, easy answer to this question is uh, what I already spoke about when I went to China because it was like so weird and random and like, God, I remember uh, like my dad dropped me off at the airport and he was like, he said like, I don't know what the exact words he said, but like, good luck out there. Like, look after yourself. And I thought, damn, what the hell am I doing? I'm like, just turned 18 i'm flying to china by myself to work this is the weirdest thing ever like that was my first job <laughs> working in internship in china country i spoke no language uh first three days i spent on the toilet after eating like spicy noodles so yeah that was like crazy for me but like the best thing i ever did also so i think that's the most adventurous uh really yeah 
Sometimes it isn't the farthest that we've gone. It's the, it's the moment that we, that, that we change. And you said before that was mm, your defining mm. moment. Yeah. What is something that you're not good at, but you wish you were? Trusting people, I think. Because uh, that's actually one thing I've learned recently is to um, – actually, it's funny I say that. I trust people way too much sometimes. I mean, scam like hell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, yeah, when I was younger, especially in business, I lost like thousands to these people, these various different things. Like uh, I was just trusting these people. I was like supplying them with like clothes. And they were like, yeah, send me half the clothes. Then they'll send me the money. Then I'll send the other half the clothes. So obviously I sent the first half of the clothes and never heard from them again. And I always, I honestly, like, yeah, I've been in the, <clears throat> quite a few situations where I've like trusted people way too much. But in business, I've struggled to like delegate, delegate, delegate tasks a lot. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm still quite... Um, is the word arrogant about it. Like I always think like, yeah, I just can't delegate this task because I just know how it's done. And then like, I finally like decided to test myself delegating it. And it's always great. It's always great. Not always, but uh, I need to do more of that. I need to get a lot better at that or just better at the, yeah, being relaxed about it or testing it more. Um, yeah. It's a good skill to gain for sure. What <laughs> you've eaten all over the world. What's the best meal or food experience that you've ever had? Well, as I told you, uh, just before we hopped on this, uh, interview, I had a massive buffet, which knocked me out to sleep, which was absolutely amazing just now. So I feel like I can't even think about what else has been better easily. My favorite meal to eat is eggs. Benedict. Uh, I eat, in Bali, I ate that like seven times a week, every breakfast. Um, and the best place I had it was at Finn's Beach Club in Bali. So nice. maybe that's my answer. Uh, I'm not so sure. what, what makes an Eggs Benedict, what, what makes a, an Eggs Benedict better than the rest of the other Eggs Benedicts? What makes it perfect? First of all, it has to be with salmon. And the salmon has to be nice, but that's not too hard to do. And then I like it when the hollandaise sauce is a bit like unique. So like not just standard hollandaise sauce. Like here in Thailand, the hollandaise sauce sucks. It's not very tasty at all. In Bali, they had all these different variations of it and it was amazing. So, uh, so yeah. But uh, actually the meals that I remember the most are the ones like when cool things happened. So like um, uh, the day after I met my girlfriend, we went to Jollibee. Uh, this is like two and a half years ago in Philippines. And like, yeah that the food there sucks in my opinion doesn't taste very nice but that makes it like super memorable for me so that's making me think that probably the most amazing food i ever tasted i probably forgot about if nothing memorable happened there <laughs> right because it was the experience and not the not the food itself I exactly get, i get that i i feel fortunate that one of the best experiences for me is also where my favorite where my favorite meal was which we talked about earlier at yeah. The, Ka the Kahala Resort in Hawaii and the Corral and Curry sitting on the ocean in Hawaii is not a, not a bad experience to have to while you're, uh, while you're enjoying the food. Yeah. You have many dots on the Google map. <laughs> you have these green ones where you want to go. Where is your dream yeah. travel destination? Where is the, the one that you say that is the place that I want to go the most or that I'm the most excited about? Oh my God, you should not have asked me this question because this is probably the number one topic I think about every day, but, but not destination, just destinations. So we're probably going to speak for an hour now. But, um, <laughs> let's, let's pick a couple <laughs> or a few. I mean, okay, well, there's obviously like, this is probably a bit of a boring answer and it's definitely not my, my dream dream, but like, I haven't been to Maldives yet and they have amazing like overwater villas and stuff. It's so expensive to go there, but that is like obviously going to be nice whenever I go there. But for a long time, my dream destination, maybe the dream is the wrong word has been North Korea. Um, actually I set myself the goal in 2017 that I would visit North Korea. Um, two problems with that, like to visit North Korea, I need to, uh, like I can't work whilst I'm there because you have no internet um, access to the outside world. 
So I wanted to do like, I was looking at like a 27 day tour where you go around a lot of North Korea, but I mean, 27 days without internet. That's a bit scary for me when you're running a business that relies on internet every day. Right. Um, anyway, and when you struggle to delegate. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> totally. Especially in 2017. Um, but now there's a big issue because if I go to North Korea, I'm going to have a hell of a lot of trouble getting into the US ever again. Like uh, they're really strict on it now. So I want to visit every country in the world before I die. And North Korea might be the one that I miss out on. Or maybe I'll do that just before I die. <laughs> how many right? The last one. How yeah, many the last one. How many hopefully not the hopefully not the final one. Just the, the last one you that you knock off the list. How many yeah, have you been maybe. to so far? I have an app on my phone. I think it's sixty. Okay. Um, That's a pretty big haven't number. No- haven't knocked any off recently because um yeah, we the most recent one I knocked off was Cambodia a few months ago. Um so yeah, I've done everywhere in Southeast Asia now, apart from Brunei. Um, so yeah, the big the big hole is really obviously there's many countries, but South America I haven't touched yet. The closest I got was Dominican Republic. So yeah, that's like a, a new part of the world to discover. Although half of it's pretty dangerous at the moment. But that right. brings me on to another destination. Um, Peru looks amazing. Um, also Chile, damn, and Argentina, so many. <laughs> it's a it's a long list, and and it's as you discuss it, I, I I wish that everyone could see the joy on your face as you talk about these <laughs> destinations. You light, you sat up, your eye, your eyes are bright, you're smiling, you're like, I need to go to these places. That is that that drive and that vision is incredible. Last one, what do you hope? or believe will be the most exciting invention of the next 30 years. Yeah. You want me to pinpoint one, right? What I would love to see is, I mean, a cure for cancer, but there's also heart disease, right? Is like a massive killer also. So any one of those two would be great. I'm not sure how curable heart disease is, uh, well, of course we haven't even come up with a cure for cancer, so I don't know how curable that is either, but, um, yeah, solving those issues would be great. But if I'm going to talk about, um, something that's not like, uh, like health related, I guess, then cheaper travel, not for me exactly, just for the sake of the world. Um, because yeah, if you're from the Western world, you can easily find money to save up for flights and stuff. Uh, wherever you want to go but um yeah a lot of people will never get the chance to leave their country and a lot of that has to do with um political stuff i know with my girlfriend's visa uh with sorry with my girlfriend's passport makes it so hard for her to enter a lot of countries even though there should be no reason why it's hard so yeah that's always going to be an issue but like also some people like don't even you know some people won't earn enough money in a year to buy a flight ticket to the next door country. So um, yeah, innovations around that would be exciting from that's a bit unique to me just cause I love travel so much. I want people to see as much of the world as possible and a lot of people don't. So yeah. The specifics may be unique to you, but when I ask this question, the answers are largely in two broad categories, medicine and health and travel. Of some form or other. Interesting. It, it's been an interesting trend to observe over these <clears throat> over these first twenty podcasts or so. As well, I we, think another. Go ahead. Sorry, I had just thought of another one. Uh, I don't know what the invention would be because we already have the inventions to combat climate change. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the the younger generation. Uh, I shouldn't generalize, should I? But there is a big push from the younger generation to uh, for to to politicians of the older generation who are not taking in uh taking climate change seriously to concentrate more on that hopefully over time we will see more of that happen but it's it sucks sometimes like especially in asia i see a lot of like plastic waste in the sea and you see firsthand like that's just one example and that's not even really climate change to be honest that's just pollution like for no reason 
like putting plastic in the ocean and killing animals and stuff like <laughs> stuff like that. So uh, that's not really an invention, I guess. It's just like a seeing policies change to stop like pollution and air pollution and climate change and stuff like that is yeah going to be nice. But I think that stuff will happen in big time in the next 30 years. So that's more part of generational change as opposed to maybe a specific invention. I get that. And yeah, yeah. there, there are so many problems in the world that will be solved simply by changing behaviors. And I say simply as if it's easy to change the behavior of a world population. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's so true, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's simple. That doesn't make it easy. Yeah. Is, as we wrap up, is there a thought or a message that you would like to leave with our audience? Oh, put me on the spot here. Hmm. I would say like, um, stop listening to me and go and do something because, uh, sorry, stop listening to me. Listen to all the other episodes <laughs> of, of this podcast. And then of course, do, and then do something. <laughs> Yeah, because like, I don't know, a lot of people spend a lot of time reading a lot of advice about a lot of stuff and don't actually go and do something. And like, I've always just gone and done something and it's always ended up well, uh, not always, but often. So yeah, I see that happen a lot and it doesn't really impact me that much if you don't go and do something. But if you do go and do something, whatever that something is, it will um, probably be good, not bad. Um, that's what I've realized. So yeah, great. That's my last ending message. <laughs> How can our audience find you and what are you working on? Where, where should they connect? So the best place to find me is on my Instagram, which is at Tom James DJ. Actually funny. I still use the DJ handle. I changed all my social media to Tom James DJ when I started becoming a DJ and then now I'm not really a DJ anymore, but I don't know what I would change it to. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's still me. Maybe I need to get back into uh, some DJ appearances, but um, yeah, Tom, D Tom James DJ is my Instagram. So that's the best place to like stalk me and message me. And my website's also linked on there. So that's kind of my, my hub and what I'm working on at the moment, just so servicing my clients obviously but what i really want to do is <clears throat> be able to like um help more and more clients so the best way to do that is package up what i'm currently doing for certain niches i don't know whether that's in the form of a book or a course or a video series or whatever and be able to sell that well give some of it out and sell some of it to people so they can just like copy literally exactly what I do. Um, so that's like a big focus of mine over the next year to um, focus on building products like that. And if I'm correct, you also offer an audit for people of their marketing, of their current marketing. Is that correct? Yeah. So um, I started doing this like I don't know, six months ago and I was a bit scared, but it turns out to be really fun and awesome. So if anyone has a, um, uh, an advertising account of any, uh, any account. So like a Facebook ads account, a uh, Snapchat advertising account, Google ads account, any type of online advertising. Um, we're happy to completely audit all of your campaigns. I may regret that if I get some people coming at me with, uh, like, you know, account spending multi millions per month, cause that will take us a long time to audit. But anyway, um, yeah, we offer that for free. Um, and then we give, uh, advice back on what we would do to change things, to improve things and suggestions for like new campaign ideas, um, like strategy ideas. Uh, so yeah, I'd love to do that. That's great. And for those of you who are sitting here and listening and thinking, this guy sounds cool. A, he is. B, follow his <laughs> Instagram. He has some of the best pictures and images and stories that you will see out there. And C, if you have an advertising account, take advantage of this audit. It is powerful information from an incredibly insightful guy and his team, and it will bring value to your world. Thank you so much for, for joining us, Tom. I'm really glad we were able to connect and um, I'm just happy and appreciate you sharing your story. No, thank you very much for having me. You asked some, uh, 
some deep questions got me thinking uh, and it's very fun. So thank you very much. Beautiful. Thank you, man. Have a joyful day. Thank you for joining us on the Dreams Are Real podcast. If anything we've said has inspired you to dream bigger, live more boldly, or move closer to your ideal life, please reach out and let us know. And also be sure to share this episode with a friend. We would be honored if you would like, subscribe, or leave a review for our show on your favorite podcasting platform. And for more discussion of this episode and all things related to the Dreams Are Real podcast, and to receive your free download of Dan's Defining Your North Star training, please join our Dreams Are Real community on Facebook. Until next time, be amazing and keep crushing it.